Okay, thanks for your patience as we're getting started here. Uh, yeah, so I started to say, but didn't quite finish it, that um, I'm just gonna recklessly use information like this, you know, sine of pi over six is one half. We're gonna, I'm not gonna rewrite this chart and whatnot there. We're gonna use that information. That way we can cover more examples during this time. Uh, all right. And as I said before, don't hesitate to interrupt. We're gonna plow recklessly forward and I'm wait to hear you guys say, stop, stop, Brian, that's not good enough. And I will happily stop. Okay, so solving trig equations. The very first thing we talked about in this unit, on the interval within one rotation of theta, zero to two pi, solve this thing. Well, you can factor this thing directly, but oftentimes I think students find it easier to make a substitution, to say, hey, something squared, something number guy, this looks like a quadratic formula, fancy way of saying ax squared plus bx plus c. If you make the substitution, u is equal to sine of theta, then you can rewrite this thing as twice u squared minus three u plus one equals to zero. And we're used to that being x. I mean, you could call it x as sine is theta if you want, but that's kind of say u is a little better because uh, x is cosine guys, right? We don't want to mix that up because we're using that substitution. Anyway, that's uh, beside the point. We know what to do here. Uh, anything of the format ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero, you try and factor it. So 2u and u is the only way you can get 2u squared. One and one is the only option there. And to get negative three, you need negative, negative. Two things multiplied together equal to zero. One of those two things has to be zero. So 2u minus one equals zero and u minus one equals zero. We'll set them both independently equal to zero and solve them. Uh, 2u minus one equals zero leads to u equals one half and u minus one equals zero leads to u is equal to one. Now it's time to reverse our substitution. So we're not interested in u, we're interested in sine of theta. So reversing the substitution, u becomes sine of theta equals to one half and sine of theta is equal to one. Now we know we're interested in values of theta that work for this in the first quadrant. So Sine of theta equals to one. Sine is the, the y coordinate on the unit circle. And so that's gonna happen only at theta equals pi over two within the first revolution of the angles zero to two pi. With respect to sine is equal to one half. Well, sine is the y coordinate. So sine is one half in the, in the quadrants one and quadrant two. Uh, and that happens at angles pi over six-ish, pi over six, and that makes this one five pi over six. So theta equals pi over six and five pi over six, and we have ourselves three potential answers for this problem. You could also, if you like, you can factor this thing directly, two sine of theta uh, times sine of theta is the only way you get that equals zero, and then one times one, and then minus minus. But oftentimes people find the substitution easier to see. Okay. Remember I said I was gonna go quick. Uh, I will of course post these uh, notes. All right, so now we've got a trickier one. We've got, this doesn't look like ax squared plus bx plus c, and it doesn't, I don't see any way that I can algebra it into shape really easily to make it into that format. So. Thought process on this one is I got sines and cosines. I got more cosines. Maybe I can rewrite this in terms of all cosines and that'll make it into a problem I can do. So we're gonna leverage once again, ye old Pythag, sine squared plus cosine squared equals one, gives us that sine squared is equal to one minus cosine squared. So we're gonna replace that sine squared with one minus cosine squared there. Whoops, I turned my video on. And when we do that, we're going to get um, one minus cosine squared of theta. We just replace this in for sine squared minus cosine squared of theta equals one plus cosine of theta. Ooh. All right, now I'm going to move all of this stuff from the right or the left to the right. Why am I doing that? Because I see that we have these two negative signs in front of cosine. And if I combine them on the left, I would get negative two cosine 
squared. And I don't like negatives in front of the squared thing when we're dealing with quadratics, because I suspect what that's going to become this. So moving everything to the right, what we're going to get is we're going to get one cosine squared and another cosine squared added over gives us two cosine squared of theta. And then I've got that positive cosine of theta that's already on the right. And then I have this one, but as I subtract that one, that's gonna add to zero doing the same thing over there. It's gonna actually add to zero. So I'm gonna be left with two cosine squared of theta plus cosine of theta equals zero. You guys with me? Give you a second to look at that and say, hey, that's reasonable or hey, that's not. You could have also, it wouldn't have mattered um, as an aside, you could have brought everything from the right to the left and set this thing equal to zero, then you'd have negative two cosine squared of theta minus cosine of theta equals zero. And it, it would get you there as well, but I kind of like positive things. And then you could just add those over. Either way, it's the same deal. Now, if you want to, you can do again a substitution. Anytime you see a squared on a cosine or, or, or on a trig function and, and you can't like rewrite it and get rid of it, you can do a U substitution, but I, I wanna challenge you on this one to say, hey, that, that, that is just something equals to zero. And if I can change it into a multiplication problem, then I can use the same concept we did last time. I see that there's a common cosine in both of these. So I'm gonna factor out a cosine of theta is equal, uh, uh, and then when I factor that out, well, I had two times cosine squared of theta, take away a cosine, you have two cosine of theta, because cosine times two cosine of theta gives you two cosine squared, plus, well, I took the one, factor the one out, so I'm left with just one, because cosine times one would give me that cosine above. Now I have two things being multiplied together equal to zero. So I set both of these things equal to zero independent. One of them has to be zero, so I'll set them both equal to zero. Whoops, yep, cosine of theta equals zero, and two cosine theta plus one equals zero. Solving both these things, we have that cosine of theta equals negative one half on the right, and then cosine of theta equals zero. There's not much to do with that. Remembering that cosine is the x coordinate on the unit circle, where is cosine going to be zero? Well, it's not going to be zero there. Shouldn't have filled that in. It's going to be zero at pi over two and three pi over two. Once again, we're working within zero to two pi. So if this left problem gives me theta equals pi over two and three pi over two. I hope. Yeah. Now, cosine of negative one half. Where is cosine going to be negative? Well, cosine is your x coordinate, so it's going to be negative in q3 and q4 is where we're going to have negative cosine. And yes, thank you. Quadrant two and quadrant three. Sorry about that. But yes, thank you for correcting me. Um, so in quadrants two and three, cosine is negative. And cosine of what gives us one half? Cosine of pi over three-ish. And so this is, gives us that we want theta is going to be two pi over three and four pi over three, because three pi over three would be pi. You wanna count that one up. And so we've got, you know, this is Q2 and this is Q3. So in this case, we have four answers. Now I thought this one was worth having a look at a, the, a graph of what's really happening, just so you could convince yourselves that, okay, that seems reasonable. So we'll go ahead and fire up a real quick graph of this rig. For some reason I've got Firefox as the default browser on this computer, so forgive me while it thinks about it for a second. Put this into a little bit thicker, easier to see, and check this out. The blue graph represents the right-hand side of the equation, one minus plus cosine. The left graph, or the red graph, represents the left-hand side of the equation. And where are they equal? Exactly at those 
four points that we found. Pi over two and three pi over two at the top, and then four pi over three and two pi over three respectively. Just kind of a neat way to check your work. Graph the right and left side of the equation and see where they intersect. All right, on to the next thing. Verify the following expression. And for these type of problems, you start with one of the side and work it into the other side. So I'm gonna take the left-hand side and I am going to be lazy and not rewrite it. And I'm just gonna say, this left-hand side is circle star. Circle star is equal to everything in terms of sine. So tangent is, or sines and cosines is sine over cosine. And I'm gonna be lazy and drop the uh, theta here. Cotangent is cosine over sine. And if I'm gonna add these to something, to those ones, I need to get common denominators. So for the one on the top, I'm gonna to make it cosine over cosine, just preparing to add these things together. For the one on the bottom, I'm gonna make it sine over sine. Once I have done that, I can then add these things together. So on top, I'm gonna to have cosine plus sine over cosine squared. No, 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 that's not how you add fractions. You just leave the bottom alone, don't you? Combine the tops, leave the, new, the denominator the same over cosine. And then and the denominator, I'm gonna have sine plus cosine over sine. All right. Now I have a, a big fraction, which is a little fraction being divided by another little fraction. So that is the top. And I like my signs before cosine. Sine plus cosine is the same thing as cosine plus sine. So I'm going to write this as sine plus cosine over cosine times the reciprocal, the flip of the fraction we're dividing by. So sine is now on the top and sine plus cosine is in the bottom. Now, when you're multiplying fractions, you can reduce common factors. And since the, those uh, sine plus cosine are common, I can reduce away that entire thing. I like to put parentheses around it to remind myself that it, the whole factor has to be uh, common. And when you do that, what are you left with? Well, you're just left with one times sine, so sine, and then cosine times one, so cosine, and we've done it. We turned what we started with into tangent, which was our goal. Now with these types of problems, there might be another way of doing this. This particular one, I think this is the best way to do it. But as you, if you guys think back to when we were covering this stuff, oftentimes you guys had suggestions of stuff I hadn't thought of or different ways of doing the problems. And those are absolutely okay, as long as you're just applying legal rules. And what you do is you start with one side and manipulate it into the other. You don't work with both sides. You start with one and you make a path to the other. Does that make sense? All right, should we do another one? I think we shall. All right, ready, steady, go. Um, you know, I like sines and cosines, so I'm just going to do the same thing over here. Tangent, I'm going to work with this. So if I weren't trying to save time and be lazy, I would rewrite that. I would rewrite that I'm starting with tangent theta plus cotangent theta over secant cosecant, and, and then I'd put equals. And so tangent becomes sine over cosine. And once again, just to save pen strokes, I'm going to drop the thetas plus cotangent, and you know what? Leave yourself just a smidge of room to the left of sine cosine there between the equal sign, or, or a smidge of room before the uh, plus sign over here, either way on one side of the fraction. And then cotangent is cosine over sine all over secant, well secant, every trig has its co, so secant is cosine, one over cosine. Cosecant, every trig has its co, so it's one over sine. Now, what's the ugly part? The adding on the top. The bottom, I could just multiply those together. Nothing much to do there, but I need to add these fractions on the top. And that's why we wanted to squeeze a little bit of room in there. To, to do that, I need common denominators. And each of them has a different denominator. So for the cosine denominator, I'm gonna multiply it by one in the form of sine over sine. And for the sine denominator fraction, I'm gonna multiply it by one in the form of cosine over cosine. That is going to let me do the math of my new denominator is going to be sine times cosine. And I'm going to get sine times sine is sine squared plus 
cosine times cosine is cosine squared. I kind of, I combined those fractions and then added them all together in one step there on the top. Now on the bottom, I got two being multiplied, but I'm gonna multiply them. So one times one is one and cosine times sine is just cosine times sine. Okay, now what can we do? Hopefully you guys see sine plus cosine or sine squared plus cosine squared and right away you're like, hey, Pythagorean theorem, one, it feels like I'm trying to get one. So I'm gonna make that change and see where it goes. So now what do we have? We have one over sine cosine all over one over sine cosine. That's the same thing over the same thing. If you see that, you can see that it's one, but I honestly wouldn't until I said it out loud. What I would do is I'd take the top one and divide it by the bottom one, which means multiply by the reciprocal of the number, the denominator, which gives us cosine times sine over one. And now we can reduce away those factors because they're being multiplied in between on the bottom cosine to reduces with cosine, sine reduces with sine. And sure enough, any way you slice that, that's gonna give you the one that we wanted. All right, next, we're gonna look at some sum and difference formulas. Now, these ones I have printed out for myself and, and I would encourage you to either make your own or have it ready and available. I've definitely got a sheet with all these formulas on it. so. I'm not gonna write out all the formulas here, but this is gonna be, I will, I'll kind of start with this one because it would be nice of me to do so. Um, so this looks like alpha, beta, alpha, beta. This looks like one of those sum and difference formulas. In fact, it matches up to the format of sine of alpha minus beta. And so sine of alpha minus beta here, what could we do with that? because I don't know what these values are. They're not nice key angle multiples. Maybe they're half angles or other formulas, but, but what could we do with this? Well, I could say, all right, let's, let's fill in alpha and beta in this uh, left-hand side formula. Sign of alpha is pi over 12, minus beta is seven pi over 12. And so what does that give us? Well, that gives us sine of negative six pi over 12, Hey, that's, that seems kind of okay because that becomes sine of negative pi over two and sine is the y coordinate on the unit circle at negative pi over two, it's gonna give us negative one. So we just turned that whole thing into negative one in a relatively slick method by applying the sum or difference formula. Just kind of looking at it and saying, hey, that looks exactly like and fits that format, let's see what happens. If you're a real glutton for punishment and don't do it this way, you could use the half angle formula to figure out what all those things are and you're still gonna get one. You're just gonna work about four to five times as hard. Ready, next. Now, maybe we're gonna do something else. I don't know. It's still titled summer difference formulas. I don't think I try and get too tricky on this test and I, I, I will have a look at it and, re, and revise. I'm telling you now, I'm not gonna try and get too tricky on this test. I'm gonna say, hey, apply the sign and difference formula for the following problems things like that. So sine of five pi over 12, what can we do with that? Uh, we could say, hey, this might be a sum or a difference of something. So what you can do is you can take all of the key angles, zero pi over six, pi over four, pi over three, pi over two, and write them in terms of the denominator you're interested in. So that's gonna be zero and two, so two pi over 12, uh, four times three is, so that's three pi over 12, uh, four, four pi over 12, and six pi over 12, something like that. And then you can ask yourself, given all of these new fractions, now I can just look at the numbers in the numerator and say, hey, how could I combine them to get five? And the ones that jump out to me is two pi over 12 and three pi over 12. In other words, pi over six and pi over four can be used to add together to get five pi over 12. So five pi over 12, what we're gonna har harness here is the fact that two pi over 12 plus three pi over 12 is equal to five pi over 12. And these are pi over six uh, plus pi over four respectively. And so if I just go ahead and put these inside of a sine function, I have, 
the sum formula for sine. And so I need to look up the sum formula for sine with alpha and beta as pi over six and pi over four respectively. And when I do that, I get sine of pi over four, cosine of pi over six, plus cosine of pi over four, and sine of pi over six. Now, all of those are key angles, and so I can do those with relative ease. Uh, sine of pi over four, root two of two, cosine of pi over six, root three over two, plus cosine of pi over four, root two over two, sine of pi over six, one half. Do some maths, get root six plus root two all over four into whatever format I ask you to, but I'll let you in on a secret. I, I pretty much, you can stick it in whatever formula you want. Don't stop here. Algebra it into some kind of a nice format at the end. All right, plowing recklessly forward. How are we doing? We're doing okay. Establish the following identity. This is a sum. So let's apply the sum formula for sine, which I think we just did. So we're gonna use that same formula. So sine this stuff right here is equal to, and we're not starting with this, we're working towards cosine. So sine of pi over two plus alpha, we're gonna treat pi over two like alpha and theta as beta. I think I said pi over two plus alpha. I meant pi over two plus theta. We're gonna treat alpha as pi over two and beta as theta. Whole oh, tongue twisters and rhymes. Sine of pi over two, cosine of theta plus cosine of pi over two times sine of theta. Sine of pi over two is one. Cosine of pi over two is zero. So that whole second expression is zero. So we end up with one times cosine of theta is just cosine of theta and we did it. All right, that's enough sum and formula ones. So that's quite a bit. So let's look at this one. It's the title change, double and half angle formulas, cosine of 165 degrees. Well, when I prepped for this, what I did was I kind of took half of 165 and that gave me something to the tune of 88.2 or five or something like that. I don't know, that's don't check me, right? But it wasn't a nice, I cut it in half. What I did then was I multiplied it by two and 330 is equal to two times 165. In other words, 165 is one half of 330. And so we're gonna use the half angle formulas here. So what is the half angle formula? It's that one that has, uh, what is it? I'll, I'll write it out. This would be a good time to write this out. Cosine of typically we use alpha for some reason, alpha over two is equal to plus or minus the square root of one plus cosine of just alpha over two all underneath the square root. Now the plus or minus is important outside because the plus or minus refers to the original angle. So I kind of think that we should probably make the plus or minus decision before we even do any math and say, hey, where is cosine of 165? That is in quadrant two and cosine is negative in quadrant two. So we're gonna do the negative version of the formula. Now, the way we apply this formula is we say, okay, so cosine of 165 is the same thing as cosine of 330 over two. Now, 330 over two, that's a half angle formula. So I can, let's put that negative in there. We've already made that negative decision. So we've got one plus cosine of 330 over two. So what is 300 and cosine of 330? Well, that would be in this picture. I'll just use this picture. No, we'll draw it again. All right, so the picture down here, that would be 30 less than 360. So that is 330. So it is, you know, I like radians. If you like 30 degrees, you do you, but I'm gonna call this negative pi over six because that makes me look at my chart. And for negative pi over six, I see that cosine is going to be the X coordinate. It's going to be positive in this case. So note here that if we had chosen the plus or minus based on this 330 angle, we would have chosen positive out there and we would have been wrong. So always with respect to that original angle. So that's important distinction. Anyway, 
cosine of pi over six is something to the flavor of root three over two. So when you do this math, you get one plus root three over two, all divided by two, all underneath the root. And you're like, ick, it's an icky number, but it's an exact number. And that's valuable. Moving on to the next thing. Oh, what could we do here? Product to sum formula. It says express this as a thing with only sines or cosines. And so we look this thing up and we say, hey, this thing looks an awful lot like if we treat six theta as alpha and four theta as beta, then this thing looks like the formula one half cosine of alpha minus beta minus cosine of alpha plus beta, depending on the combinations of sine and cosine and whatever you have there. Maybe the formula is a little different. They each have their own formula, but this one fits that format and it becomes a game of filling in the blanks. So filling in the blanks over here equals one half cosine of alpha is six theta minus beta is four theta minus cosine of six theta plus four theta. Is that right? Good thing I'm not looking at my paper because we're going to do this right compared to my paper, which is wrong. Cosine of twice theta minus cosine of 10 theta. And I think I had eight theta on my paper. I did, which is not right. Yeah, and well, we did it. We did what we were asked to do. We expressed the product as a sum, something being added or subtracted, containing only sines or cosines. In this case, it's only cosines. Non-right triangle trigonometry. You've got the law of sines and the law of cosines. The law of cosines I manipulated. Basically, I just um, for angles, you just solve for cosine of A and you get it in that formula. And so we listed all those out, nothing to see there. Okay, let's try and do a couple examples. I will admit I don't have these numbers calculated out in front of me, but I do have this to start it with. So let's try and do this as an example. Um, angle A is 36, angle B is 24, and side B is 16. Let's draw ourselves a picture and see what we can come up with. All right, relatively quick picture. All right, so we're going to call this angle B here is 24. Angle A is 36, and those are both less than 45 degrees, so that's reasonably accurate. We don't know angle C, so we'll label that C. We don't know side C, so we'll label that C. I don't know side A, so side A would be opposite angle A, 36. And side B, we do know. Side B is 16, so opposite that 24, we're gonna have 16. Now, I see that I know an angle and a side um, together. Well, you know, an angle and a side, law of sines is my favorite. It's easier to use than law of cosines, and that screams law of sines to me, because I can write something to the tune of sine of 24 degrees over 16, the related side is equal to sine of whatever, over the related side. Now, I don't know either of the C's, and so I will use 36. So that's gonna be an angle, so that goes in sine, and A is that. Yada, 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 algebra it out. A is equal to sine of 36 times the flip of that, 16 over sine of 24. So that equals some number and that number is your answer. How could we find angle C? Because before I find side C, I need angle C. Don't forget what we already know. Angle C is equal to 180, the total minus 24 minus 36. And again, that equals some number. Once you know that number, law of sines, you can solve for C. Good enough for that one. Let's look at another one. Um, I, I'll say it out loud. I promise you guys not to ask you one of the ambiguous cases that leads to two answers for these triangles. So there you go. You won't have the ambiguous case. Maybe you'll have a case where no answer is possible. But you won't have one where there are two angles or two possible triangles solve it for the law of sines case. All right, now what picture does this look like? 
uh, 75 and 50. Those are pretty close to 60. So this triangle is going to look something like an equilateral triangle, but not quite exactly like one. Okay, so for angle A, we'll make this 75 degrees here. That's across from side A, which we're not given. Angle B, that's 50 degrees here. That's across from side B, which we're not given. Side C here is 210. And how would we fill in angle C? Well, once again, angle C is 180 minus 75 minus 50 to be some number. This is the dodgiest review ever. Um, okay, so which, which method? This really, the point of this is to say, hey, if I don't tell you which method to use, how can you figure it out? Well, draw a good picture, fill in what you know, and then see, hey, is it gonna be possible for me to use the one I favor, the law of signs? And it is, though this can be law of signs because you know a starting one. You know sine of angle C, that number we just found, over side C, 210. And then you've got the other angles so you can work with it to find lengths of sides A and B. Um, you probably can do this with law of cosines if you want to as well, but oftentimes I encourage you to, actually you can't, you have to use law of sines. For law of cosines, you need to know at least two sides, looking back at the formula. And we don't have two sides in any of these cases. So the only option here is law of sines and it would work. And so dot, 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 law of sines this thing into shape. Well, you can probably guess that if we had two examples of law of sines, our final example is gonna be law of cosines, but let's just pretend we don't know that. So let's try and draw ourselves a reasonable picture here. How's this one gonna look? Six, I know what 60 degrees looks like. It looks like that. So that's 60 degrees for angle A. And you know what, I don't know much about anything else except for that they're different distance lengths. So I'll just make one longer than the other clearly. And so there's angle A, side A, um, side B is shorter. And so this is gonna be side B at six and this is angle B. And then side C, the longest is nine. So that's angle C. So what do we know and how can we solve things here? All right, all right, all right. So let's see, what have we? Um, you know what I can do? I can use law of sine, cosines. A squared is equal to B squared plus C squared minus twice BC uh, cosine of A. All right. I know cosine of A, that's cosine of 60 degrees, uh, two times BC. So B squared is six squared plus C squared is nine squared minus two times six times nine. Do some math on that and get a number. 36 plus 81 minus, oh boy, some giant number. Uh, cosine of pi over six, what is that? Is or, 60 degrees, cosine of 60 degrees is one half. So this is five times uh, six times nine, which is 54, I think. 36 plus 81 minus 54, some number. 81, 36 gives us seven, eight, 9, 10, 11, uh, we'll take away 54 from this and we'll get three and then five off of 11 is six. So A squared is 63. So A is equal to the square root of 63. So you get square root 63 there. Now you have all three of your sides. This means that the next thing we need is an angle. So you can use one of the formats of law of cosines for angle. So you could find angle B as a squared plus C squared minus B squared over 2AC, dot, dot, dot. Once you know two angles, just go ahead and use 180 minus angle B minus angle A equals angle C to finish out this triangle. All right, ready, steady, on to the next thing. So just a couple slides here of some summary stuff. Uh, 
because this stuff we have done slightly more recently than a lot of the things we've covered. So I wanted to do examples for the stuff that was farthest away from what we've done so far. Um, polar coordinates uh, on the unit circle, X is cosine of theta and Y is sine of theta. So if you just extend the radius of the unit circle to an arbitrary R, then X is R cosine of theta and Y is R sine of theta. And from all of that, you have the other two formulas, the Pythagorean version and polar coordinates is x squared plus y squared equals r squared, and tangent of theta is equal to y over x. So skills I want you guys to be able to do with respect to polar coordinates is to plot polar coordinates given a blank grid, convert polar coordinates back and forth between polar and rectangular, and the equations as well. And then we'll, after we do that, to have a look at that, we'll get into the graphing expectations as well. So. Polar coordinates, convert the following polar to rectangular. Well, one of the first things I do whenever I do this problem is I always kind of graph the picture first. So six, zero, what's six, zero look like? Well, it might be helpful to remember that polar coordinates, I'm using the P to represent polar here, are given in the format of R comma theta. And so that is an angle of zero and a distance of six, one, two, three, four, five, six. That point right there, that's six zero. And it turns out that six zero is six zero in x comma y as well. There's just by drawing the picture, you can see that, that that conversion happens. Now, when they're not on an axis, the game gets a little bit more challenging. So in blue, oh no, what did I do? All right, here we go back to polar coordinates. Too far, too far, too far, too far. There we go, back to polar coordinates. In blue over here, we'll do P uh, two comma pi over four. Well, you're using this same grid here, pi over four is like this, and we'd go a distance of two. That doesn't tell us anything about the X and Y. So we'll have to know, use facts that we know. Well, when you convert from polar to rectangular, it really is just an application of X equals R cosine of theta and Y equals R sine of theta that kind of foundational fact about polar coordinates. Well, we have R and theta here, so it's a game of substitution. Our radius is two, our angle is pi over four. Yep, and Y is equal to two sine of pi over four. Either way you slice this, you're gonna get two times root two over two, which is just gonna give you root two. And if you think about that, does that make sense? Well, if you're at the pi over four direction and you go distance of two, what you have is a 45 degree angle. And so if you draw the little uh, Pythagorean triangle here, it should have sides of the triangle that are the exact same length. In this case, root two squared plus root two squared gives you two squared. So yeah, hopefully um, that makes a little sense as well. Now to go the other direction is typically a little more challenging when you're given a rectangular point and you go to a polar point. I didn't write down anything except for the answer. So shall we wing this together? When we first presented it, I had kind of a bullet pointed out step-by-step -step thing, but we don't have that in front of us today. So we'll just have to think this through. So I think the good first thing to do would be draw a picture and see what we're dealing with. 12 in the x direction is pretty far. And then 12 divided by some number is not quite as far in the y direction. So here is my point in x, y land. And uh, if I draw this, what do I know? I know that the base of this triangle is 12. And I know that the vertical of this triangle is 12 over root three. That seems like some fairly helpful information there. What are we after? I am after theta and r. Which one of those can I find? r, application of the Pythagorean theorem, thank you. So yeah, so 12 squared, first we'll find r, 12 squared plus 12 square root of three quantity squared is equal to r squared. Um, brushing a lot under the rug, 192 is equal to r squared. This tells us that our radius is the square root of 192. Good enough, it's a number. So now we have to find the angle. 
And the angle, to do the angle, yes, we know the radius. We could use any of the trig functions we like. Theta starts with a T. We're going to use tangent because we know the adjacent and the opposite. So tangent of theta is equal to opposite over adjacent. So 12 over root 3 over 12. Well, 12 over root 3 over 12 is 1 over root 3 because 12 over root 3 divided by 12, 12 over 1, 1 over 12, the 12 reduces away, the root 3 goes on the bottom. Now, what's 1 over root 3 in terms of tangent? Well, that is 1 half over root 3 over 2. Why would we make that change? You guys know how to find an angle for tangent. Yes, you could fire up arc tangent. But we don't need to because these are not, this is a key angle one. What angle gives us sine of theta gives us one half and sine of our cosine of theta gives us root three over two? Well, that happens at pi over six. So this tells us that theta is pi over six ish. We know that our problem is in the first quadrant, so pi over six is our angle. So in polar coordinates, this point is square root of 192 pi over 6 for the angle. All right, next. Convert the following equation from rectangular to polar. Well, here's where that summary page is going to come in handy. x squared plus y squared is r squared. So we can directly just say, all right, cool. This is r squared equals to 2. This is r equals the square root of 2 polar. It's a circle of radius 2. And that's what it is in both formats. Next, r is equal to 24 over 3 sine of theta plus cos 7 cosine of theta. What, my friends, are we going to do here? But well, when we're converting from polar to rectangular, we want to find x is equal to r cosine of theta. I want r cosine of theta because I could just substitute in x directly. And I want to make r sine of theta because I can substitute directly in for that for y and x respectively. I see some trig stuff on the right-hand side in the denominator, and I see an r on the left-hand side in the numerator. If only I could get that r kind of times through to that trig stuff. So to make that happen, we're gonna, this is a, a blatant and, and inappropriate abuse of notation here, but I'm gonna take and multiply both sides of this by the denominator, three sine of theta plus seven cosine of theta. I really should you know, write this twice. I'm just gonna be a little lazy here and say that we're doing the same thing over here. You guys, that work? And so what happens? Well, on the right, the whole thing reduces away. And on the left, I get r times 3 sine of theta plus 7 cosine of theta, and parenthesis equals 24. I did, and now I just say, hey, let's distribute that r through. 3r sine of theta, oh, there it did. There was the trick. Plus 7r cosine of theta. And there it is again. There's Now we can. Now we've got those R's and those trig stuffs together as they're underlined in the upper right-hand corner. That is three times Y plus seven times X because R cosine of theta and y, R sine of theta, are X and Y respectively, is equal to 24. And we did it. We got rid of all the R's and thetas and turns them into X's and Y's. And so we're now living in a rectangular world. How about this one? Oh no. What have we got? What, what are we going to do here? Let's try it. Let's see what happens in terms of sine and cosine was a suggestion here in the room. So tangent is sine over cosine. Theta, we should keep the thetas here. Secant, every trig has its co, one over cosine. Hmm, that's not looking terribly promising here. I'm gonna see cosine squared and I'm getting a little scared. So let's go back to the drawing board. And if you look back on that summary page, we don't use it very often, but tangent can be substituted in directly for 
y over x. Tangent of theta is y over x. So I'm going to go ahead and deal with that one just like it is and say, all right, that's at least one part of the puzzle dealt with. Now I see one trig piece and one R piece. And as usual, I want to try and get them together and see then if I can somehow turn them into R cosine theta or R sine of theta. So now I'm going to, I know we did it above, but now I'm going to say, hey, I don't like secants. And I know there's no substitutions for secants. So let's make that into cos one over cosine of theta. Once again, we have the problem of the R's and cosines are on the wrong sides. So let's multiply that cosine of theta on both sides. That gives us R cosine of theta on the left side is equal to twice Y over X on the right-hand side. R cosine of theta is X. So now we can substitute in for that to get X is equal to two Y over X. And while technically we've done it here, we're smart enough that when we're working with rectangular equations, we should probably solve for y equals. And so we're going to do that in red here. We're going to multiply both sides by x. That's going to give us x squared is equal to twice y. And then dividing by y, we don't divide in this class. We multiply by 1 half. 1 half x squared equals 2y. Good enough. Again, this is a summary slide. Uh, there are better summary slides. I just copied something that had already been typed. And so use those. But uh, graphing polar, polar coordinates, symmetry tests was something that we had to do. Check and see about the symmetries of all the things where you replace the inputs or even the R's, the combination of both, with different inputs and see if you get the same thing. And as we saw in class, it's possible for a curve to have the type of symmetry but still fail the test. Oftentimes, this test is not as reliable as this test, for example. Oh, and so these examples take a long time. I'm not gonna ask you to do three or four of these, but I, I, I guarantee you there's going to be a graphing polar coordinates like process, just like the homework and just like the examples we did in class on the test. So, oh, we're not logged in, but that's okay. Tell me it's going to work. You're going to let me do this little computer? Well, we're going to do it the other way. Old fashioned, we're not going to use a link. We're going to navigate there. Come on, little internet, go. Come on. Refresh. I find it helps to uh, encourage the internet at times. Send it good vibes. And it works. Sometimes it doesn't. The internet could use some encouragement. All right, so why, why did I say see the course site? Well, because there's a lot of different resources here. I think there is in the uh, reading assignment, there are additional notes which have examples. There's even a polar coordinate summary and examples here. Let's see what that is. That is a document. And on that document is some things, or are some things rather, to use appropriate grammar. Yeah, there's a summary. That's good. We could work our way through this. There's some facts. Hey, here's some interesting things about graphing things. Are there, oh, here's the process of graphing. Uh, let's see, and then there's some example graphs. That's just stolen from the textbook. And then there's a little bit about, hey, here's an example. One minus cosine of theta. First thing you want to do, you want to test through the symmetries. And so it works through all the steps for it. it. It uses the fact right here on this line where it says implies yes. That's using the fact that cosine is an even function. So fails vertical symmetry test, fails polar symmetry test. And so we've decided that our polar axis of symmetry would be important. So we'll look at uh, theta values from zero is less than the theta. And you know this is supposed to be I don't have my controls, I can't read it, but right here, that's zero less than, theta less than pi, folks. I left a less than or equal to out. So yeah, take a look at all the angles in there, do the calculation, get your r comma theta point, plot those r comma theta points, you'll get the upper half of that sideways heart, whatever that thing's called. And then using symmetry, the fact that it's symmetrical about the polar axis, that what we think of as the x-axis, it's vertically symmetrical, you can just flip that thing down into the 
bottom hemisphere and you've got yourself your completed graph. Yeah, I think this one might be called a limic limicon or cardio cardioids. I can never remember the names. Uh, and then here's, so there, are, uh, instead of taking this and walking you through this, uh, I'm seeing typos left and right in this. <laughs> Because that shouldn't say in the middle of the screen there, it shouldn't say two minus zero as the input to sign. It should be two times negative theta. But if you overlook my typing errors, these examples are a pretty good walk through the process. And I encourage you to go back through and review the process and make sure you're comfortable with the process because there will be one of these on here. Hint, hint, it will not be this one that gets down the rabbit hole of complex numbers and whatnot and has two things. We never did a R squared one in class, but I did that as an example. Anyway, this isn't the only example posted. I encourage you to look at the reading assignment. There are a few, some more. At the end of this, the regular handout notes, there are actually several examples typed out in there as well. So just make sure you're comfortable with the process because there will be a, a question asking you to go through that same process that we saw on the homeworks. Complex numbers, take the form. Z equals A plus BI. Here, we're into the material that we talked about last week and this week. So I didn't write down any specific examples. I just copied and pasted some summary here. And I, the absolute value of a complex number is on the formula sheet. And I didn't take it out because I am too lazy, but you guys don't need this. You know it's just an application of the Pythagorean theorem. And so plotting a complex number, we could plot one. We could say z is equal to negative 3 plus 2i. And then we'd say, all right, that's the real direction is your x-axis and the imaginary direction of z and of z respectively, negative three in the real direction, two in the imaginary direction. Here's your point, z. And then getting funny, just to go down on an example, z bar would be negative three minus two i. And so I know I said a z bar again. There we go. There they go. The conjugate has, conjugates have kind of an interesting symmetry when you think about it. And, and we rabbit hole, we're going to approach complex numbers and in polar coordinates here, there's there's kind of a, a logicalness to this. There's a radius and then there's an angle associated with these polar coordinates as well. This one would have, that would be the theta and that would be the R. And so accidentally, we kind of built up to the next idea, which was complex numbers in polar form, where instead of thinking in terms of X and Y, we'll think of in terms of polar angles and distances, radiuses, if you will. <sighs> Who typed these? Come on, this I should totally not be behind theta. It should be like here or here or somewhere where it's clearly not in the trig part. Anyway, um, recall what you already know. R squared is equal to X squared plus Y squared. There's your formula. Be able to convert a given complex number to polar form. So, um, Oh boy, should we should we try and make one up? Yeah, why not? Given complex number. Hey, we had a perfectly good complex number on the last slide. It was negative three plus twice i. And we had a nice picture of it too, where we said negative three, two. There we go, there's z. And if we wanna find the complex form of this, we need to know what this radius is and what this angle is. Well, heck, from that picture, we can just, I don't even need any formulas. I can just trigonometry this and think, hey, let's leverage the trig that we know and fire and think of that as a right triangle. Well, to find R right away, we just use Pythagorean theorem. R is equal to the square root of the X direction, negative three squared plus the Y direction, two squared. Uh, let's see how, how badly of a number I chose. 9 plus 4 is 13, I want to say. So that rig is the, we have a, a radius of the square root of 13, and that's a perfectly good number here. So now the hard bit, theta. Yield tangent again. Tangent of theta is equal to y over x. So in our case, it is 2 over negative 3. So negative 2 thirds arc tangent theta is equal to inverse trig, arc tangent, arc tangent of negative two thirds. 
We're going to work in radians, ladies and gentlemen. I have a calculator, and I'm going to use it. Oh, no, I have to find the function. Arctangent, uh, negative 2 divided by 3, gives us negative 0.58. That's what we're going to go with. Now, is that right? Why is it wrong? Yeah, we're in that uh, second quadrant, and arctangent goes between returns values from, we know, negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. So arctangent gave us this value down here of negative 0.58, right? And so any way you want to do it, you could think of that as saying, hey, that's the same as this angle. And so our actual angle theta is going to be pi minus that. And let's do it that way. I think that's a very nice way to do that. And so our actual angle is theta is equal to pi minus uh, 0.58. 3.14 minus 0.58. Oh no, we have to do some subtractions with carryings. 6, that's a 0, that's a 2, 10, 5, 2.56. Let's say it's 2.56 with the acknowledgement that there could be a subtraction mistake, but I don't think there is. I think I might have nailed it. But yeah, so remember, the only thing you have to be careful with this is, my goodness, this is a good exam question. Note to self. Um, yeah, good, good. Oh, I didn't actually put it in polar format. Well, polar format would be to replace theta and r into that formula, and you've got it. So z would be equal to the square root of 13 parentheses cosine of 2.56. z is equal to square root of 13 times cosine of 2.56 plus i sine of 2.56. If you were to fire up a calculator and simplify this, Jazz, what would you get? I encourage you to try that on your own and on your own time. Fire up that calculator and, and do it. Cosine of 2.56 is going to give you, because cosine gives you something between 1 and negative 1, so it's going to give you a, quote, small number. It's going to shrink down root uh, uh, root 13, which is, I don't know, bigger than 3. Shrink it down to negative 3, or dangerously close because we rounded it off. And I sine is going to go down to 2 as well. So, yeah, that's kind of neat. Yeah, and we're not going to do any examples of this because this is literally just identifying r1, r2, theta1, theta2, and following your nose through some formulas. And I promise not to do. Like this, this problem I find related to trigonometry and interesting, whereas these are, are, in my opinion, just an exercise to do. What's this? A blank slide? Doesn't, I don't think it's supposed to be blank. You guys are looking at the, sc the screen and seeing a blank slide. However, you should not be. So I'll show you what you are missing. to pre-calc. It's a summary of vectors with no examples attached to it. It's just a summary. So uh, it looks like this. Lecture notes and worksheets, unit review. It's, it's the summary that's attached to the, it's the summary that's attached to the end of the, end of the typed up thing too. There's a lot, but then the reason I didn't get into vector review is because this is the stuff we talked about Thursday. And I wanted to end this by opening up this general review to questions. So give me a moment here. Let me stop this recording.